Good afternoon, guys. Let's talk about starting protocols. I typically have two starting protocols. They both involve testosterone, cypionate and HCG. Both of them involve daily injections of both. And again, both of them involve the administration of the testosterone and HCG via the subcutaneous route. Why? Daily mimics natural physiology as much as possible. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, and subcutaneous because it's less painful and causes less aromatization. So what we're trying to not achieve, now I say what we're trying to achieve, is a, a healthy testosterone to estrogen ratio. Because if that ratio is abnormal and you have an excess of estrogen from either too quick absorption or having a propensity to excess aromatization through excess body weight, liver dysfunction, exposure to endocrine disruptors, then you will have an abnormal ratio of testosterone to estrogen. And that can have negative symptoms such as anxiety, water retention, bloating, uh, breast tissue swelling. So obviously gyno is well recognized that it's an abnormal testosterone to estrogen ratio. It typically occurs in as neonate, puberty, and as you age, because the estrogen goes up and the testosterone goes down, causing breast tissue development. So, two starting protocols. One, has a normal dose of HCG. The other has a normal dose of HCG. So I am not advocating HCG monotherapy because I believe there would be potential downregulation of the receptors in the testes through excess stimulation. And we also know that high doses of HCG can cause an excess aromatization of testosterone to estrogen. So the principle behind my starting dose is to maintain function. Because I like the idea of maintaining testicular function. I don't like the idea of allowing testicular atrophy um, and guys not appreciating the potential qualitative benefits that they will feel with HCG in their protocol outside of wanting to maintain fertility and testicular size. Is my starting protocol for HCG optimal for testicular function? Um, it depends on the level of testicular function available to me when we prescribe HCG. So obviously if somebody presents with a primary testicular problem, or primary hypogonadism, sorry, um, then they are less likely to have such a positive result from taking HCG. My standard HCG starting protocol seems to be effective in maintaining function. However, if some of my guys want to conceive and they are struggling, then what I tend to do is I tend to up the HCG dose to hopefully improve testicular function and we subsequently reduce the testosterone dose to compensate. And we have actually found that to be very successful. I've had a guy recently who uh, was trying to conceive and he, we saw him at his new patient consultation and I gave him a slightly higher dose of HCG than I would do normally and after four weeks, his testosterone's come back at 42. So clearly, he had potential testicular function that has been optimized by exogenous use of HCG. The potential compromise is estrogen, as I said, but actually his levels were fine. So um, yeah, we're super pleased because um, his levels have come back uh, demonstrating that he has testicular function because his starting dose of testosterone was uh, my normal starting dose for my young guys um, 
And what we do is if that's not enough, we obviously titrate up. Any changes should be slow and methodical because if you implement dramatic change, your physiology reacts. Now, a good example of this is a, uh, er not erratic, an inappropriate injection frequency. So dailies, I'm 100% sure is best because it mimics physiology as close as possible uh, and it lessens the chance of side effects. So excess estrogen, abnormal HCT, abnormal HDL, LDL, etc. Um, we don't want to cause a dramatic spike or a change because your body is forced to react. It's forced to react. So if you inject testosterone sipinate once a week, then you will have a peak and a trough. So you may have a very healthy trough level, but the peak will be causing physiological change within the body in the days preceding the trough level. So dailies, stable, less side effects, more like natural physiology, more like, not exactly the same, because that's not possible especially since you're administering something that is exogenous, uh, whether it be in the form of testosterone, that does not go through the same... Uh, it's, not, it's not absorbed the same or, or metabolised the same. Uh, and the HCG, as spoken about before, is a constant supply of HCG to the testicles, not uh, released from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to send LH down to the testicles, which has a, has a super short half-life. So the release of gonadotrophin, releasing hormone down from the hypothalamus to the pituitary, is in a pulsatile manner. So it is slightly abnormal, but it's as close as damic. And an LH analog would obviously be stupid because the half-life of LH is super short. So you'd have to inject multiple times a day to, to perfectly mimic physiology. So it's not possible. So we have to work with what we've got, and what we've got seems to work pretty damn well. So two starting protocols. What's the difference? The difference is the testosterone dose. Um, for my older guys and for my guys who are more primary, they have a higher starting dose of testosterone sipinate because obviously I'm expecting their testicles to be not as responsive as guys who have a predominantly secondary hypogonadal picture. Makes sense, doesn't it? I hope it makes sense. So, testosterone replacement therapy should be hormone replacement therapy. And the premise behind it should be maintaining function and supplementing with testosterone. It does not mean that you give crazy doses of HCG because of the reasons already discussed. Add nauseam. The mechanism by which it's delivered is different and obviously the effects are slightly different because the mechanism's different. Um, and we can optimize HCG stroke testicular function through increasing the dose but it's at the potential expense of excess estrogen and down regulation but I don't believe, don't believe that actually happens at the doses that we give uh, HCG because they're in no way shape or form um, similar to uh, HCG doses used in HCG monotherapy and by the guys trying to restart their te um, testes in their PCT cycles. In no way, shape or form do they resemble them whatsoever. I do not want to put you onto an aromatase inhibitor. So, we are always working to make sure that you can reduce your propensity to aromatization. Estrogen 
is incredibly important. I have never ever crashed estrogen. Some of my numpty patients have who have not not <laughs> not done as I've instructed them. Um, taking 25 milligrams of examastane versus 6.25, which is a quarter of a tablet every four days. So our average dose of examastane is 1.6 milligrams daily. So you're not gonna crash estrogen with 1.6 milligrams if appropriately prescribed. And funnily enough, it's appropriately prescribed because I only make the decision to prescribe an aromatase inhibitor on lab work. So it's incredibly important to have lab work so you have a foundation or a basis to work from. I do actually prescribe 6.25 every four days to a few people in their starting protocols. Now, why do I do that? Dr. Stevens, you're going to crash estrogen. Never happened. Never. Um, why do I do that? It's mainly the chunky monkeys. And if somebody's got a diagnosed fatty liver, then you know that they're going to have a propensity to aromatization. And their four-week bloods, and again, we do four-week bloods not because they're stable at four weeks, but because we are trying to predict and hence prevent an issue never reveal crashed estrogen. We do not believe in blocking estrogen unless you have gynecomastia. So we've had very positive results from using tamoxifen to block estrogen when patients have gynecomastia. But it's only a short course, up to about three months, and uh, it can have negative complications, or, uh, so, such as a decrease in IGF-1. Um, you don't want to use a drug unnecessarily. I have always been a massive advocate of less is more. That does not mean that I don't want to get your numbers up to high normal, but within the range. So... We've already highlighted that the reference ranges have decreased uh, over time and we can make a justification for using the reference range of a couple of years ago because we understand the mechanisms whereby the reference ranges are created and why we are becoming sicker. So you can make a justification for having high normal levels um, and the reference ranges that most laboratories use reflect our current society. And guess what? That's a sick society. So very disappointing. NHS endocrinologists believe that abnormal is abnormal according to the sample population now. However, the sample population now is a sick society. So we fortunately have the British Society for Sexual Medicine Guidelines um, that state that less than 12, obviously you are a potential candidate for TRT and we should be aiming for a range between 15 and 30. Now I don't want anybody at 15 because unless you've got an incredibly low SHBG, your free testosterone is gonna be awful. So. I like my guys up between about 25 and 30. Um, some guys can be higher if they have high SHBGs, but what we don't do is we don't overreact to these guys at the start and give them a big dose of testosterone to crash their SHBG. We wanna make sure we do things logically and methodically, and what tends to happen with these high SHBG guys on the standard starting protocol is that SHBG slowly comes down and we don't have to mess around too much. So if you crash your crash your estrogen, crash your own SHBG because you've been given a high dose of testosterone, what has caused that high SHBG? Dramatic changes cause problems. So you don't ever want to 
dramatically do some dramatically do something. Deary me, uh, it must be cracking on for fifteen minutes now. Um, so you always want to do things logically and methodically. Always. So you always have to appreciate there are millions of processes going on in your body, and uh, change should be done logically and methodically. So. 15 to 30, nobody wants to be at 15 unless you've got super low SHBG. But what we like to do is we like to see patients have an increase in SHBG if they've got uh, low SHBG because of low testosterone. Now, if your low SHBG is as a result of diabetes, hypothyroidism, uh, metabolic syndrome, you need to address those aspects and then appreciate that your SHBG will hopefully go up with a resolution of those pathologies. So, I hope that all makes sense.